Welcome to Low Code Prototyping, part of our series on digital transformation using low code and the collaborative design process. I am Ron Kagan, visiting scholar at UC San Diego's Design Lab, and this presentation is for the graduate seminar at UCSD, where we focus on current applications of human centered design for inclusive automation across organizational boundaries. By way of introduction, I'm CEO at ExpressSoft. We've automated international finance using low-code platforms since the late 1990s. This has provided end-to-end -end automation for global business. But first, what exactly is low-code? Low-code software uses development platforms with built-in components. These already take care of a majority of the basic functions. I'll be demonstrating this shortly. These platforms allow you to design screens and user interactions using drag and drop components. You can design documents, reports, emails and notifications, and create calendar events. In the process, the development platform assembles your databases, complete with tables, views, and secured from access by a layered security system. Data is stored either on the enterprise server or in the cloud, and once in place, you can query the data for trends, markets, client segments, and also the ability to test out new products and services. What makes low-code ideal for software development these days is that once designed, the software runs on multiple types of devices. They come with drag and drop components and templates. And importantly, they allow non-programmers to participate in the coding process using simple formula and logic. Low-code puts the logic in the hands of those closest to the work at hand. If the market for these platforms is any indication, the adoption of low-code is growing at a brisk pace. Projections show the market for low-code platforms is growing at a fast clip, upwards of 28% annually through 2025. And for good reason. According to Forrester Research, software projects are accelerated by at least tenfold with low-code platforms. Half of all medium and large enterprises, according to the Gartner Group, will adopt low-code as their strategic platforms in the near future. What makes low-code such a perfect fit these days? The answer is that the current environment is highly fluid. We have a growing complexity in our systems. They serve many markets and disciplines. Our companies are under increased competition, both domestically and globally. And to adapt quickly, product life cycles have shortened significantly. Uh, hang on one second. There we go. That's better. Okay, more on our solution later. And also, demographics of the workforce continue to change, and customers are requiring the ability to customize products themselves. Responding quickly to these changes and changes in functionality is one of the hallmarks of low-code software. There's not just one size that fits all, but a number of basic types of low-code software. There's business process management, that rolls out workflow across an organization, customer relationship management that streamlines sales cycles and campaigns, web design and publishing focuses on building a digital community with uh, web information. Digital communications are out there with platforms that organize uh, groups online for discussions and forums. Gaming and simulation platforms and also system integration that helps move data between systems using triggers. So a range of platforms allows you to start small and grow into a larger offering to your organization and clients. 
So what's the difference between low code and traditional coding? Well, it has a lot to do with the types of components that are assembled into the final software product. Traditional coding uses full stack development, many times using low level languages such as C Sharp, JavaScript, and C++, or frameworks such as Vue.js. Developers have to build the client side as well as the server side. Low code has the unique advantage of having integrated components that can be assembled, customized, and then rolled out quickly. These components are very stable. With larger organizations, any changes to these components are automatically incorporated into the rest of the system. Changing screens, for example. With traditional coding, the components are more dependent, passing pointers between objects many times or creating an array of instances. One change to this type of code can ripple through the system and, unfortunately, cause crashes. One of the key advantages of building on a low-code platform is its ability for rapid prototyping. Prototypes are versions of the software built by teams and reviewed by end users. Prototypes help organize screens and workflows, documents and views. They can also test security, data access, and exceptions. Because coding is simplified, end users can actually assemble prototypes that fit the work they do. Customers can weigh in on its ease of use. If something doesn't work, fixing it can be a matter of minutes to resolve. Building successive prototypes fine tunes the design. It involves the larger organization, including customers, and keeps management in the loop at all times. Prototype begins many times as sketches. You can sketch it out on paper or use digital pens on cell phones and tablets with such applications as Autodesk Sketchbook, Paint 3D, Adobe Elements, or Fresh Paint. These apps help you to visualize what the final product will look like. Move these around for a different order. And once in place, you can post them to other members of your design team for their comments. Next, you can prototype your workflow. This can be a simple process for maybe the steps involved in entering and revising customer information, for example, or larger to orchestrate a um, organizational wide picture of departmental workflows. Many platforms have built in workflow modules that help to visualize the process. Each task can be prototyped by a subset of people who know the details of the work the best. Involving them in the workflow early on saves a lot of changes later in the development process. How you present information to your end users makes a big difference. You can prototype these screens using drag and drop components, such as fields or groupings of fields, tabs, warning and error flags, you can also add user notes or an action bar or the ability to handle multiple windows open at the same time. That's a lot to code if you're using traditional programming languages, but low code makes prototyping very easy. Once you design a screen, low code automatically can produce the code for all types of devices, desktops, cell phones, mobile devices of all sorts. Databases are built out with table schema and many times with the encryption where you need it. This saves a complete database design step. These prototypes can be rolled out to a larger organization. Suggestions can be tried out on the next set of screens and all this handled by the low code platform. As I mentioned, this presentation is actually a prototype. So we're actually going to be working in the meta prototype arena, as it were. 
Our presentation is built on a low-code platform called Construct 3 from Scura. It's easy to put together and actually a lot of fun to do. So for this presentation, I prototyped my screens using Construct 3. Now, this is a straightforward platform where each screen is a layout. And on the layout, you can create objects and move them around to the positions where you want them. Each layout is connected to an event sheet and the event sheet tells the layout what to do. Think of the event sheet as a computer program, but as you'll see, you don't need any computer language to jump in. So let's do that. Let's jump in. What I wanted to do was use a stack of pancakes to show how fragile stack development can be. And I wanted the pancakes to drop on a plate and have gravity play its role. So I created this layout, breakfast, as you'll see at the tab at the top. And on this layout, I put a pancake right here. I put a plate right there. And I put my old friend, the squeegee, off to the side. And actually, there's another object. It's my title. It's a text object. So the three pictures are called sprites. And for each of these, I could paste a picture into their palette. Let's see this. So here I pasted a picture of a pancake. Looks pretty yummy. And I'm going to use this in my layout. Now, each of these sprites has a number of behaviors. And you'll see properties for each one of these running down the left-hand side. Let's take a look. There's the name of my object, some more properties. You can see the position right below it, there, the size there, the background color if I need it. And if I scroll down, you'll see a list of what are called behaviors. I'll collapse this, expand it again here. And there's a number of behaviors that I gave my pancake. The most important one, which I really like, is the physics behavior. That made the pancake uh, obey the laws of gravity. It also gave certain types of properties to it. For example, you'll see elasticity at 0 0.2, which helped me to more or less calibrate how I wanted that pancake to bounce. There's my physics property. And I wanted to do the same thing for the plate. The plate I also wanted to have physics. In this case, a very important uh, property in the physics or parameter is that it's immovable. Something hits it, nothing happens to that plate. So as we have one or more pancakes hit the plate, guess what? It doesn't go any place. And here's my squeegee. It also has physics as one of the behaviors of that particular object. But also, for my physics, excuse me, for my squeegee, I also wanted it to be moved manually, what we call drag and drop. I can put parameters on how I want it to be dragged and dropped, but that's basically a behavior. And I can add more to the squeegee. Here's the three I have already. What more do I want? I now have a full list of all the behaviors I can add to this sprite. This is a great idea because I no longer have to memorize these. It's presented in a full list. So we'll close down the behaviors. And I may want to change this now that I'm thinking about it. So I'm changing the property on my text object. If you recall, this is my fourth object on my screen. And here's the property of the text object, where I can actually change the text in the object, which of course makes perfect sense. Once in place, 
I now have my breakfast layout labeled breakfast and I've moved my squeegee off the screen because now I'm going to go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. Now I have my pancake falling because the physics is in place and my title now is breakfast. So let's take a look now at my event sheet. My breakfast layout has an event sheet with all the events that I'm going to use for my animation. And you'll notice there's only three. The simplest is the first event. It's when the system, it's a system event, and it's when the layout actually starts. So it triggers this event. And what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to give the pancake that I have a gravitational pull of 10. And then, just to be sure, I'm going to set my squeegee to invisible. So when it starts up, as you saw, the pancake fell and the squeegee was nowhere to be found. Now let's create some more pancakes to fall on that plate. And I have to use my one key on my keyboard to trigger more pancakes. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have the system create another pancake object, another pancake sprite. It's going to put it on layer three at a certain XY position. And once I have it, I'm going to assign gravity to it again, a gravity level of 10. Well, let's take a look at how we do this. I'm double clicking on my create and it look, it says I can create an object. What do I want to create? I look at my list. Any kind of sprite or object is listed there. But I'm going to create a new pancake, put it on level three. I'm going to put it at the X position right over the plate and off screen at the top of the viewport, minus 200 pixels. Pretty nice. And then what am I going to do? The next action I'm going to have is to go to my pancake object. And I can select any object, but obviously I want to create a pancake and here it is. And I go to the types of actions I can do with that. And here is my set world gravity, which is what I want. And I set that to 10. Pretty nifty. So every time I hit one, it's going to create a new pancake. Now I'm going to use the two on my keyboard to begin working with the squeegee. If it's visible, that means I've been using it. I'm going to move it off screen and set it to invisible. And if it's invisible, which is the else in my condition, I'm going to make it visible and put it on the screen. So you have an example here of a conditional if squeegee is visible, else do this. So I've put together my program without actually programming using my breakfast event sheet. Let's take a look at what it looks like now. There's my first pancake and I'm going to hit my one key repeatedly here. There we go. Go more. And oh, that. Oh, oh, no. Don't tell me. Oh, geez. There it goes. I thought, oh, no, I can't believe it. Although I really can. Let's clean this up, shall we? I press my two key and here comes my squeegee right across the screen. Clear that up. Let's clean up the screen. And there you have it. Let's put my squeegee away with another two key. And we've just programmed one of my layouts. So some final thoughts. 
Low-code software can be rapidly prototyped and respond very quickly to a changing environment. It uses simple logic and screen design along with a wider hub of users who can participate up front. With rapid prototyping, development can be accelerated. This means reduced time and expense to put software into production. Now keep in mind, low code is not a silver bullet. There are different types of platforms, so you need to choose the right one. And design teams need to include the end users and even customers in the design process if possible. Prototyping is iterative, and so teams should roll out different versions until they've refined the functionality to their satisfaction. This has been a presentation for UC San Diego's Design Lab. Our thanks to ExpressSoft for their assistance in the preparation of this video.